to be here to launch this book in Delhi. Uh, so it's so nice of all of you to come. Thank you very much indeed. It's a real privilege and a pleasure for me to be here today with Sunita Narayan. I've, I'm a great admirer of the work she does. Uh, the kind of activism she does, the kind of expertise she brings to this is really, to me, something awe-inspiring. You know, um, I've admired her work for, for a very, very long time and thank you very much, Sunita, thank for doing you, this. Thank you, Abhisar. I'm honored. I'm absolutely, I, I'm a big fan. So, you know, when I was asked that will I do this, I was like, of course. I mean, is there any question about it? And of course, you know, because climate change is all about politics as well. So the only thing I told Varun when he asked me is, I know Amitabh's politics is good, but still, let me just check this out once before I completely, you know, say yes, yes, yes. And of course, I had no question about it. I mean, uh, his politics is bang on. But I think, Amitabh, the question that you've raised in the book, in the book and I think that's what I think many of the people here would like to know from you a little more is, one, what made you do this? But then for me, the big question is, why is it? And I ask this with some amount of anguish and sort of anger and, you know, why is it that the question that you've asked, why is it literature? Why is it that we are missing this big, you know, elephant in the room thing? The one event that will change our present and our future, why is it that we are missing <coughs> this? We are not having a conversation about it. And you discuss this very much in your book, and that's what made me fascinated. So, please. Well, absolutely, this is absolutely the fundamental question in my book. And, you know, <clears throat> of course, I'm a writer and a novelist, so it's the question that really engages me. Uh, you're an activist, you, you come at it from a different angle. I'm not an activist, but uh, what interests me in that sense is exactly this elephant in the room. How is it that we as writers and artists, we pride ourselves uh, on our foresight, on our insight, on being able to understand and see things in this world that others don't see? And yet, in relation to this, as, which is, as you, as you perfectly rightly point out, something that is happening in the present, something that is profoundly impacting all our lives, how is it that this is not considered the stuff of serious fiction? How come in as much as, fic as fiction approaches this at all, it's within genres, within which also extraterrestrials and so on are, are dealt with? You know, I mean, that's the really peculiar thing about it, that within our imaginative universe now, Dealing with these issues has become really uh, considered, uh, it's really considered a fringe activity, mm. you know. Mm. And it's so extraordinary to think that, you know, uh, people who've lived through these uh, incredible deluges in Mumbai, these incredible deluges, uh, this deluge in Chennai, um, almost nothing has come out of it in terms of imaginative production, you know. I believe there's one, uh, there's one film which refers, which has a scene set in the Mumbai deluge of 2000, 2005. But other than that, there's almost a complete silence in as much as the imaginative discourse is concerned. No, that is, I mean, that does worry us tremendously. And you know, but I keep, when I was reading Amitabh's book, the thing that I kept thinking about is how the monsoons were so important for us as Indians. And, you know, I grew up, every Hindi film had to have a monsoon shot. And it was part of, you know, what actually even today moves us. I mean, if you think about it, I, I keep saying we wait to exhale. Um, and we watch the monsoons moving from Kerala up the coast, and then it stops. We stop, and then it sort of moves up. And so the monsoon is part of our reality and yet we don't see it so much today. I mean, I, I, I come from a different world, but I keep asking this question differently, differently to what you have asked. But I keep asking how many in this room would even be able to name a single monsoon scientist? Nobody, I'm sure. Because they just don't exist. You will name Abdul Kalam as a rocket scientist, missile scientist. I mean, that's sort of manly. You do these things because you take us to space. But something that ha determines your, your finances, your future, your livelihoods, your today and your tomorrow, 
you don't have in conversation. You don't even know who they are. That's so well put, actually, because if you think of our classical arts, the monsoons are absolutely fundamental to them, you know? Um, I think of music. We have all these wonderful monsoon rags, Rag Meg, Meg Malhar, Nyaka Malhar. There's so many, you know, uh, I mean, there's a music for the monsoons. And when you actually have a downpour outside your house and you're listening to Rag Meg, it's, uh, it's, it's an extraordinary transporting uh, experience. You look at the work of, say, uh, Satyajit Ray. In Satyajit Ray, Mahir Machali, the beautiful way in which, you know, the lyrical first half of the film uh, it, uh, and, and the sort of really tragic second half of the film, the hinge between the two is the monsoon, you know, the coming of the rains. And the rains sort of uh, enframe, you know, the entire story, the rains, the, uh, the environment. Uh, and this happens again and again in his stories, you know, in his, uh, uh, in his films. You see it similarly in the work of Ritik Ghatok, you know, I mean, uh, uh, the natural landscape, the rivers are so powerfully depicted in his work. Today, do we see that? I mean, do we even see the representation of the monsoons uh, in Indian films? Actually, less and less, because half these films are not even shot in India. You know, they're shot in Switzerland or Turkey or somewhere or the other. Uh, you know? So in what way does, uh, does our natural environment even have an option of entering this, uh, this imaginative landscape? So it really does point us to the fact that how in a sense, we made a new reality, and that's what you also talk about in your book. And I thought that very strong point that you make about the lack of imagination and culture and changing culture. And if you elaborate on that, because I think that sort of, you know, brings a lot of this together as well, that how we have created a new reality and we've changed, in a sense, the narrative, the discourse, the conversation, the people we idealize, the, the things that we aspire towards, um, you talk about how, you know, whether it's the car or other things, it's the imagination about, you know, freedom and about all the, the, the shots that we are thinking. And as I was reading what you were saying, what you wrote, I was actually thinking of the Marlboro Man. <laughs> Which you don't talk about, but I was just thinking about how, you know, it was the cowboy and the Marlboro man, and uh, thankfully now nobody will idolize the cowboy, the Marlboro man. But you will still idolize, you know, the, the fast car and, you know, oh, with your cool. hair and your hair flying in the wind and all the, you know, that's, that's part of the new, uh, the new culture that we have sort of enveloped ourselves in. And so, you know, I think everyone would like to hear more about how you wrote about this, because it's very powerful. Uh, again, that's, that is actually so interesting, because in the entire sort of uh, European philosophical and historical tradition, really freedom is conceived of as freedom from nature. Mm -hmm. You know, people who are not free from nature are conceived of as not being able to be agents in their own history. They're conceived of as being dependent upon their circumstances. And Europe thinks of itself, or the West thinks of itself, as achieving its freedom by essentially cutting itself off from nature. So, you know, we see that reflected so much in, in uh, if you like, the art of modernity. Uh, you know, when, uh, uh, when François uh, Truffaut saw Satyajit uh, Ray's uh, Pothé Pachali, his comment on it was, pad, pad, pad through the paddy field. <laughs> you know, I mean, to him, uh, the idea that, you know, that a rural life could be, uh, could be the setting for a masterpiece was something which, uh, uh, you know, was completely at odds with his own experience of modernity, you know. So, yes, I mean, it, it happens that systematically we have turned away from being able to imagine, uh, you know, the nature of these uh, relationships uh, with the world around us. No, absolutely, but I mean, and I think that's really where, in terms of climate politics, how do you bring it back? And that's what I was asking Amitabh uh, when we were in this so-called green room at the back, uh, uh, which is not very green in, uh, in ventilation terms. But, uh, um, uh, but I think, you know, the question is, how do you bring it back? Because, I mean, I, as a climate activist, um, I mean, I think we are more and more clear, and for most people here, the reality is that we are beginning to see extreme weather events. Uh, we are beginning to see unseasonal, variable rainfall. And yes, all of us really are not affected, other than the fact that when it rains in Delhi, we can't really move. Um, and that's only because how badly we organize our cities today. 
But uh, the the fact is, the poor in the world are very badly hit. I have already very very badly hit, and they are they are not <coughs> responsible for climate change. They are victims of our excesses. And if you go and meet the farmers, they are for them. It is not about uh, you know. I can put on my air conditioner, and if it's very hot, or I can. It, it is it is survival. And how do you get these words out? How do you get the urgency out? How do you get the sense of you know, here is something that has to move societies. And that's where you as an author, you as somebody who can influence large numbers of people here, I'm really hoping that your book will help many people to understand the sense of, you know, we, it is a great derangement. Sunita, you know, um, uh, it's often said uh, about uh, climate change that it will affect primarily the poor. And it's true, the poor, poor will, in absolute terms, in numbers, the poor will be uh, disproportionately affected. But it's by no means the case that the rich will not be. Because you consider this, uh, the great 2005 deluge in Mumbai, you know, uh, so many industrialists, so many film stars, uh, Raj Thakre himself uh, was marooned inside, uh, uh, inside his house and had to be rescued by a lifeboat. You know, when the cyclone comes for you, it's not going to pick between rich and poor. You know, that cyclone is coming for you and it's coming your way. So, it's by no means the case that, uh, uh, that, the, that the wealthy will be unaffected. And even in long-term trends, it's not like the, uh, the wealthy are affected. You know, after Mumbai, I, you know, after the 2005 deluge in Mumbai, I have it on anecdotal evidence. But a large part of the IT industry actually moved to Bangalore. And that is what uh, fueled the sudden explosive growth of Bangalore. Uh, Bangalore had an equally bad flood where a lot of them were affected. So the point is, yes. where are they going to move? That's because right. They moved to Bangkok where also it was That's a bad right. flood. So, you know, and if they move, uh, so the question is, we are coming to the ends of the world. Uh, there, there's no way you can run. You know, uh, similarly, when Hurricane Sandy hit, uh, uh, hit uh, New York, yeah. You know, I know many, many wealthy people who actually uh, were marooned, you know, they had to leave their houses and so on. So, I don't know that it's actually the poor who are going to be affected. You know, if you try and ask yourself the question, just in terms of an immediate climate change impact, that is, suppose a major cyclone comes towards Mumbai and people try to evacuate. I think the people who will actually be really badly affected are the middle classes. Because the poor, uh, many of the working classes uh, 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 in the region of Mumbai, actually they're from surrounding areas, a lot of them are from uh, the Konkan area, from Ratnagiri and so on. They have connections there. They can go back there. They're used to taking trains and leaving the city. It's the middle class person who's actually from far away who won't have those options. You know, it's the middle classes that will actually be disproportionately affected. There's no doubt about that. I mean, that I agree with. I mean, you know, most people here are from Delhi, I would imagine, and all of them know when winter comes, uh, they can, even if they're a little richer, they can close their window and they can put on an air purifier, but they still need to breathe. Okay? And, um, and air pollution will affect all of us. So it's not just the poor, and it's, you know, maybe the uber rich have the chance to leave the country. Uh, but most of us don't. We have to live here. We have to fix it. So in that sense, as I always find that when it comes to local issues, there's a greater sense of, you know, we're going to have to fix this. When it comes to climate change, there isn't that sense of, there's a sense of powerlessness, there's a sense of helplessness, and then there is a sense of how will we get America to do anything? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> That's the fundamental problem. And, and because you can't move them, there is this sense of, oh, you know, so we all sort of, you know, they, they, they pick up some language and we all pick up some language and we all think we're in a party together, but we're not. I saw this amazing uh, 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 TV program hmm. which you were on yeah. uh, with the last uh, New York Times journalist and it was so extraordinary the way he was shouting you down. You know, I just, I literally couldn't believe it. And, uh, you know, that is actually what happens. I mean, the American voice often becomes, the Western voice becomes so amplified in this that it's almost impossible to register uh, a non-Western voice in those debates. But 
that's really where, you know, Amitabh, I, we, we've been, we had a correspondence on this. It's this whole issue of the intolerance debate that we really need to talk about because I think climate change reflects this intolerance where we are beginning to close the circles of our conversation anymore. We follow the people on Twitter who we'll agree to. We end up with talking to people who we, we read. We're either the New York Times readers or we are the Guardian readers. We're not the Daily Mail readers. We're not the Fox News viewers. So we will, you know, each one of us has our own circles of what we are reading and we agree with it. And that is basically also meaning, for instance, I see that when it comes to climate, I, I will never ever get interviewed by a Western journalist on climate change. I will always get interviewed by a Western journalist on local air pollution, on how my government is incompetent, how they don't fix the Ganga, how there are these problems. I will never get interviewed on climate change because they do not want that inconvenient voice. But I think that conversation, that narrative, how do you open it up? How does a writer like you actually change that so that we can get a more open conversation where we can hear each other? You know, it's very interesting what you're saying because uh, I, I just uh, spoke uh, with someone who was actually present at the COP21 negotiations. And uh, he told me that it repeatedly happened that there would be this voice, uh, someone from uh, Latin America, for example, was making a noise. Uh, a call goes out from the U.S. State Department, and he's withdrawn. Uh, you know, the, the, the Filipino uh, uh, negotiator from the past, the one who had made such a sort of impact, was not included in the Philippines delegation. Uh, the Malaysian, uh, one of the most important Malaysian voices, uh, voices on climate change, but then, uh, you know, at the last minute, he was just literally removed from the room and told to be quiet. And so what we, actually, what we are actually seeing is this systematic silencing of these voices. Uh, and that silencing now is a reality, you know. Uh, the Paris Agreement is a reality, it's upon us. But for myself, I do think that one of the most important things we do have to do is to remove this conversation from the purview solely of experts and bureaucrats. I think that is actually one of the reasons why nothing happens, because uh, these bureaucrats and uh, uh, experts have created, if you like, uh, this fiefdom. And it is a fiefdom which, will, which, uh, which confers a certain amount of power, and it will, in the long run, also confer a certain amount of wealth, because uh, one aspect of the Paris Agreement certainly is a business-friendly approach. I mean, it's not... Uh, it's not an accident that these corporations were involved in the drawing up of the agreement or these big billionaires who made their presence felt over there? No, absolutely. And I think that's really, I mean, in Paris, you will never hear the word, we never heard the word consumption. It was, it was not a word that you could ever discuss. I mean, I keep saying the C word is not climate, it's consumption. And yet, it would never be on the table because the minute you talk about the lifestyle issue, you talk about consumption, then, I mean, my American NGO friends would turn around to us and say, oh look, the Republicans will come, Trump will come, because if you raise this, then you're actually giving ammunition to the other side to see this as, they're going to take away my gun and then they will take away my car. And that's the ultimate. And you can't do that. So I think that's really where the conversation has got very, very, uh, very, very powerless because people who are affected don't have a place on the table. Their voices are not being heard. People who have even inconvenient issues. I mean, I was amazed. I'm not saying. I mean, the Indian government has had a position on the issue of climate justice. And even putting that on the table meant that the New York Times on the very same day of Paris had a cartoon which had <coughs> The Indian, the elephant, uh, blocking progress yes. in in Paris, yes. and it was Obama's legacy. And the title of the story was: Here is one man who will derail Obama's big legacy. It's 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 really. And and what does worry me is that if the Americans are saying that they are controlling climate change, then I definitely live on a different planet. <laughs> Yeah, it's absolutely the case that, um, uh, you know, uh, this, 
the whole issue of climate justice, which was recognized in earlier conventions, in the Framework Convention, in the Kyoto Convention, in the, the, people don't recognize how much the, the Paris Agreement moves away uh, from earlier agreements and conventions, you know. So essentially what it does is that the whole climate justice issue is parenthesized and, and reduced to almost something laughable. Some believe that climate justice is important. You know, uh, similarly, the, the agreement completely denies all historical responsibility, all possibility of reparations, all possibility of any kind of restitution. So all of this is just moved off the table. So, you know, Obama may have the legacy of having said something about climate change, but in fact, his real achievement uh, is something which I think will, in many ways, set the movement back by a long time. <coughs> And what you're saying is actually really uh, to the point, which is that the American approach to all negotiations increasingly is uh, to point to the dysfunctional nature of their political system. You know, to say this, uh, this cannot, you can't do this because our people won't allow it. You know, so I mean, you know, that's a kind of bizarre sort of blackmail. What else can you call it? No, absolutely, and I. But it has. It has been the dominant narrative, and that is the problem. In, I mean, I think one of the reasons why uh, why today we are all in trouble, and you write this in your book very well, is uh, the fact is that we are all, we haven't really understood that we are locked into a system in which the more we consume, the more efficient we get, but the more we we'll still consume, will mean that we are really not going to move ahead in controlling emissions. And, that these issues cannot be dealt with only technocratically. And that's where I think society, and that's, that's where right. your writing is so important, that we need to be able to get this conversation out into people and not with acronyms like RED and, you know, RED plus and CDM and all the rest of it, which actually make sure that all of us are alienated. We don't Absolutely. know the conversation. Nobody can, I, I used to say Amitabh when I was much younger, I used to say that all these men in suits, you know, worried about the commas and the food stops, you know, yeah. and uh, when they're, when climate is running away. That's right. And I think that's where we need conversations. Yes, absolutely. What you're pointing to, you know, all the conversation now is about greater energy efficiency, mm -hmm. it's about substituting, uh, 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 you know, dirty energy with uh, solar energy and wind energy. But, you know, one of the earliest energy economists, uh, Samuel Jeevans in the 19th century, he showed uh, that uh, he has this thing called the, uh, the Jeevans paradox, mm -hmm. which is that uh, energy efficiency always leads to greater consumption. Mm -hmm. You know, so it cannot be solved at the level of uh, at the level of efficiency. It has to be solved by addressing questions of consumption, and this is the question that is not allowed to appear within uh, within the discourse. But more than that, I think this is also the question that is not allowed to appear within literature, you know, because literature has also become about uh, high impact uh, uh, styles of living, about consumption. Essentially, you know, uh, modernism, modern literature is so much focused upon the idea of freedom. And really, the way that freedom is, con is, is conceived of, imaginatively speaking, is often the freedom to consume. So, for example, you just take the you just take these images that uh, that one likes the American old <coughs> movie, you know, uh, this uh, this beautiful car hurtling through uh, uh, through this magnificent landscape, which we see constantly repeated now in mm. Indian advertisements. What what is it actually? It's just a, a, it may be freedom. It's it's essentially a carbon powered freedom. It's a carbon dependent freedom. That is what freedom uh, has come has come to symbolize, you know, aesthetically speaking. But why does it happen? I mean, to me, the question is, uh, again, and I'm coming back to it, what do we do, do to change this narrative? Because in some senses, all of us are also locked into the same aspirational system, the same system in which we're saying, you know, um, if, unless you aspire, you're really not modern. And, um, and if you don't aspire, then, you know, then the law of Darwinism means that you're going to be eaten up and this is going to be marginalized. So in that, how do you actually make sure that you can get a, a real meaningful conversation about something so urgent like climate change? I mean, you discuss that in your book, and I think the question really is, how do we get beyond 
the issue of technology and the issue of saying that it's, it's really something that if we don't do it today, we will not have it tomorrow. So, you know, how do we do that? And I'm still asking you that, Amitabh, because I think you're a fresh voice in this. You look at it differently. We, I, I was there at the first COP. I feel like I'm jaded, old, completely lost in the, the, the language of climate change. I should have been buried by now. But you're new to this. You can, you can get us to all engage with a new conversation on this. And that's why I'm really excited about your book. Thank you. Really am. Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, what, what you're saying is absolutely right. I think uh, people who go through that mill of attending all the conferences and so on, they often reach a point where they can't see the forest for the trees. You know, but you've never succumbed to that. I mean, you've always managed to, uh, to keep really a distance. Because I really work on shit in Delhi, so, you know. <laughs> 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 she was just saying that her, her basic interest is excreta. <laughs> I write on excreta. But uh, uh, yes, I think that's uh, that is very important, you know, to try and uh, you know have this conversation in a different way. But again, uh, Sanita, the reason why I so admire the uh, the work you do is because uh, you're addressing questions of activism, and uh, you know I really admire the activists who who work on this subject because. There has never been any more difficult issue in the world. There's never been anything as difficult as this. And you, if you ask me how is any kind of movement to be achieved, I would have to say that I have not the faintest idea. Because everything that we have tried has failed, in a sense. Yeah, no, absolutely, Amitabh. If you, know, if you look at it, what we've done over the last many years is that, you know, we have basically believed that there will be some technological fix at the end of the tunnel. And there's going to be something that we will discover. And I think that, and, and I was just discussing this, I think, you know, that's also a sense of hope. We all live as a society. We have to have hope. We can't live with hopelessness. But that hope is also meant that we have this sense of, you know, something will come. And I hear this from even sort of top politicians saying to me, you know, don't get so worried about this, you know, something will happen. So human ingenuity is amazing, something will happen. Listen, cell phone happened, something will happen, okay? And I keep thinking the only thing that has happened in the last 30 years has been that we have moved from coal to shale. Yeah. That is the yeah. only real difference that we have made in terms of technology. So what will happen in the next 10 years that will change this so amazingly? I don't know. You know, this is exactly the question. I mean, really, uh, the very thing that has brought us to this technology yeah. is now presented to us as the savior. You know, so in so many ways, the Paris Agreement is really kind of like a magical document. I mean, the amount of stress it it, it places on technological solutions, on technological futures. You can see that it's complete. I mean, such hope is invested in this te technological redemption. Never a word about changing lifestyles, never a word about changing your economic system or of creating other patterns of aspiration. And this is why I so admire, you know, uh, Pope Francis's uh, encyclical. It's such a marvelous. A document, you know, which completely changes the subject on this. Where these are exactly the issues that he's talking about. You know, how do you lead a meaningful life? Uh, what part should consumerism play within a meaningful life? You know. No, but it becomes, you know, for all of us as modernists, it becomes really a difficult issue because, you know, we also, I also find that as an environmentalist, if you talk about some of these things, you're called a luddite, and you're called sort of, you know, you, you want to take us back to the dinosaur age, or increasingly you would also be seen as, oh yeah, you, you know, you're cute, but you really want to live in sort of some nice little fairy land, but reality is that we need to have transportation systems, we need roads, we need energy, we need jobs, we need all this, and that's what fuels the real world. And I think that's where, in my view, we have not been able to make this bridge between being able to show that there is a different way. And you know, you quote in your book that amazing quote of Gandhiji. 
Yeah. Which um, I keep thinking, what that man must have had in his head. This is the quote which we as environmentalists love to quote, which is, you know, when Gandhiji was asked, uh, what would he like the Indian civilization to be? And he replies saying, he doesn't want it to be like Britain. And somebody says, it's Hind Swaraj. And, he, and so the, the conversation that he's having with himself, he's, uh, he asks, and, but why not? I mean, Britain has everything. It has the railways, it has roads, it has progress. Why would you not want India to be like Britain? And he says, and I paraphrase him, you have got it right, but I like my paraphrase. Um, he says, if it took Britain the rape of half the world to be what it is, how many worlds would India need? Okay. I like my paraphrase. Okay. <laughs> it's a very good paraphrase. Gandhi isn't here anymore to yes. object to it, yes. okay? Yes. What you're saying is absolutely right. I mean, and uh, Gandhiji intuitively knew what is increasingly clear now, that, the, uh, that this sort of Western lifestyle was only possible for a minority, you know. But in the last 20 years, this neoliberal sort of rush towards what they call progress, we have tried to universalize that model. And it's perfectly clear now that that model cannot work uh, for the majority of the world's people. So, you know, in fact, what is really at issue here is exactly this. How does a small minority continue to enjoy its lifestyle while denying it to others? No, I, you know, Amitabh, I have a parallel in Delhi which I keep using and I think that may be a way ahead and maybe that's the conversation we all need to have. You know, most of us who live in Delhi know that the air is very polluted, but we also know that only 15% of people actually own and drive a car in Delhi. Now the point is that if only 15% own and drive and the air is already so polluted, how in the air shed will you make space for the remaining 85%? Okay? And we also know that we have already built our roads and flyovers take up 26% of our space, 26% of Delhi's land. Uh, is taken up by roads and flyovers. And that's only for 15% of Delhi. So just think about this. Now that's the conversation that you have to have globally, which is that if only such a small minority has actually pumped in this huge amount of greenhouse gases, and it's a very small minority, then what's the space for the remaining? Now, as yet, the conversation, unfortunately, has not been, we will reduce so that you can grow, or we will both reduce together. The conversation is, you don't do it, because we told you not to do it. We made the mistakes, yeah. but you should not make them. That's a better way of putting it. That's a sort of polite way. But the other way is just hit you on the head and say, you don't do it, we did it. And we'll continue to do it. Now, how do you actually get, and you know, in Delhi, I'm sure everyone here will <coughs> agree with me, if this is the reality, we will give up our cars. We will want a more efficient public transport system, but we will give up our cars because if 15% is what is taking to give us this toxic pollution, and we know there is 85% still waiting to get into the car, then we know we have to reinvent mobility. It's easier for us here. But how do we do this at the global level when we do not have, in a sense, the ability to be able to influence global conversations? And we don't have the power to say they will change because we have to change. I'm so happy to hear you talking about that because really, you know, uh, the conversation around climate change so often is about technology, it's about consumption, about commodities, but ultimately what climate change is, is that it's a relationship of power. You know, because there's a very close correlation between emissions and power. As India's emissions have grown, so has its power. As China's emissions have grown, so has its power. This relationship was established from the very beginning of the carbon economy. If you think of how Britain defeated China in the first opium war, it was by using steamers, you know. And throughout the 19th century, this was essentially the story of the 19th century, they used carbon, essentially, to, uh, to subjugate the world. The world is now no longer subjugatable in that way. You know, so this is really, I think, at the crux of this, you know. Uh, how do we address the questions of power that lie at the heart of climate change? 
And somehow, in the whole discourse around it, this never actually enters. It's, it's not addressed, it's not addressed by any of the global uh, conventions or negotiations. We just don't seem to have the language for it. You shouldn't really call your book the really, really, really inconvenient truth. <laughs>